All my life, I have wondered about the nature of God. As a child, I was comforted by the notion that God is love. And as I grew older and I perceived God less as a person and more as an action, I turned the phrase around saying, love is God. But recent brain research has raised questions about the very nature of love and the human impulse towards God. In their book, A General Theory on Love, Thomas Lewis, Fari Amini, and Richard Lannan explore the biochemistry of human bonding. This next part is brain anatomy, so... Bear with me. This might be a time to read the announcements. (laughs) They describe the brain as having three parts, calling the first the reptilian brain. This is the basic brain stem that is found in fish, reptiles, and lower animals. This is the brain stem and the part of the brain that controls breathing, heartbeat, survival reflexes like running from danger or towards prey. The parenting style of reptiles is one of neglect. Lay a lot of eggs and hope that a few survive. Baby crocodiles and baby Komodo dragons are better off not having their parents around because their parents are likely to eat them. (laughs) The second part is the limbic brain. It wraps itself around the top of the brain stem and includes the hippocampus and and it's generally where emotional responses begin. This area is the great separation between mammals and reptiles. It is responsible for the nurturing relationship between mothers and their young. Remove a mother of a young mammal Remove the mother, and it almost always results in a separation cry from the young pup or kit or kitten or child. The third part of the brain is the neocortex or the new brain. This is the part of the brain that interprets emotions and creates symbols. It is able to plan. It is what transforms fear into paranoia sadness into melancholy, anger into hatred, and happiness into optimism. While the limbic brain functions on the level of transient emotions, the neocortex gives those feelings permanence by surrounding them with meaning. The neocortex of a rat is smaller than cats, which is smaller than dogs, Primates have a larger cortex, and humans the largest of all. We humans, therefore, place a high degree of importance in our ability to think and to assign meaning. Louis Amini and Lannan write, Because people are most aware of the verbal, rational parts of their brain, they assume that every part of their brain should be amenable to the pressure of argument and will. Not so. (laughs) Words, good ideas, and logic mean nothing to at least two brains out of three. (laughs) Referring to two parts. A person cannot direct his emotional life in the way he bids his motor system to reach for a cup. He cannot will himself to want the right thing, to love the right person. Emotional life can be influenced, but it cannot be commanded. Thus we have the classic struggle between head and heart, which in reality is the struggle between the limbic brain and the neocortex. Yet it's important to note that the symbolism of the heart has its own reality. If you doubt this, tell someone that you love them with all your limbic system and gauge the result. The term heart is poetic. 
poetry is one of the bridges between the limbic and neocortical regions of our brains. But sometimes what occurs between lovers is truly chemical. In an infatuation, separations are almost unbearable. There is a rise in the brain chemicals, cortisol and catecholamines, and the same as a puppy separated from his mother. And hence the term puppy love might be more accurate than we would think. At this level, absence does make the heart grow fonder. But if the absence is prolonged, the brain chemistry changes. Despair sets in. Levels of growth hormones drop. The immune system is suppressed. In babies, this syndrome is called failure to thrive. For widows and widowers, the time that they are most at risk is in the first year after a spouse dies. Some literally die of a broken heart. Our, the, re, our re, the regulation of our limbic system is influenced by others. Mammals in varying degrees use social systems to regulate each other in their behavior and body functions. The relationship between a mother and infant shows a loop that affects one physically as well as emotionally. A mother will lactate when she hears her child cry. As we grow older, we learn to regulate our physical and emotional thing better on our own. But we never fully become independent. We need others to be emotionally stable. Lewis et al. write, stability means finding people who regulate you well and sticking with them. Three chemicals primarily regulate the limbic system, serotonin, opiates, and oxytocin. Serotonin is what's regulated by drugs like Prozac, can affect how much we grieve the loss or fear being alone. Opiates, like our endorphins, numb pain receptors. It's what you feel when you feel the runner's high. And sometimes, Loss is experienced as pain. There are people who inflict physical pain on themselves through cutting their skin or self-flagellation. And this releases soothing opiates that cover some of their emotional pain. But there are less drastic ways to release these opiates. Exercise, sex, also release endorphins that soothe the psyche. Oxytocin is a chemical that plays a role in long-term bonding. Anatomically, prairie dogs and mountain voles are almost identical. But prairie dogs mate for life and are more nurturing to their young and their oxytocin levels are higher. Oxytocin levels surge in human mothers around birth and surges in children around puberty when they get their first crushes. Have you checked your partner's oxytocin level? Right? <laughs> if a couple took a medicine to raise their oxytocin level, they may experience being in love all over again but would they really be in love? It seems that some people fall in love with the same type of person over and over again. And this is partially because the nature of relationship gets imprinted in our brain from when we are children. We often ignore potential partners because somehow we do not click we might not even see Mr. or Mrs. Wright, or Ms. Wright, should be single if we're, we're looking. 
but sometimes chemistry interferes. <laughs> Because our minds train to notice other cues. It, it is possible to fall in love with someone who's not your type. But it can be as difficult as learning a foreign language. You have to learn to hear, speak, and recognize a whole new set of symbols. When couples have fallen out of love and they come to a therapist, the therapist will often give them homework, a set of games that they need to play. Basically a way to get them in the same room doing something other than fighting. <laughs> and these scenarios often seem artificial, but by acting a certain way, the couple learns to re-regulate each other. They may have fallen out of sync simply because they have not spent enough intentional, positive time together. Love does not come from intellectual understanding each other. That it's very futile to say, if only they understood that I'm right, then they would love me. <laughs> Doesn't work that way that it works on a deeper biochemical level. Humans are wired to be interdependent. Lewis, Amini, and Lannan refer to it as the divine nature of our conjoined state. Being well-regulated in relatedness is a deeply gratifying state that people seek ceaselessly in romance, religion, and cults, in husbands and wives, pets, softball teams, bowling leagues, and thousands of other features of human life are driven by the thirst for sustaining affiliations. It's understandable why the metaphors about relationship with God borrow from our human experience. God as Father, or the Church as the Bride of Christ. In Greek mythology, the gods are always having sex with the humans, and mystics talk of being one with God. It has been shown that religious experiences correlated with brain chemistry. There have been certain reports and journals of people with epilepsy, and lesions in certain areas that they tell their doctor they do not want to be treated because the euphoria of feeling one with the universe is a kind of positive thing. In a book, Why God Won't Go Away, by Dr. Andrew Newberg of the University of Pennsylvania, they use brain imaging data they collected from Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhists lost in meditation and from nuns deep in prayer to explain how it is that religious rituals have the power to move believers and non-believers alike. They monitored blood flow and found certain areas of the brain affected by religious experience. Attention in meditation linked to concentration and the frontal lobe lights up. Religious emotions, the middle temporal lobe is linked to the emotional aspects of religious experience such as joy and awe. Sacred images, the lower temporal lobe is involved in the process by which images such as candles, crosses, facilitate prayer and meditation. Response to religious words is at the juncture of three lobes, the region that governs response to language. And cosmic unity. When the parietal lo lobes quiet down, the person can feel at one with the universe. So what do these correlations 
prove? Is your brain responding to something that is really out there? You can stimulate the brain electrically and make people see colors that are not there. But the concept of color is real. It can be measured and understood as certain wavelengths of light. But if neuroreceptors for love and religion exist, does that prove that love and God exists? Or are love and God just neocortical explanations for limbic impulses? Are they just the poetry we use to explain our instincts? The evolutionary benefit of love is obvious. Because of our potential brain capacity, we are born underdeveloped, while our heads are still small enough to pass through the birth canal. Because we are so helpless, we need adult caregivers. And our thinking brain creates social structures that reinforce our emotional bonding. We have rituals of child dedications, graduations, marriages, baby showers. All these thoughtful actions are connected to the emotional brain. They enhance social bonding and thus survival. Our social relatedness is a variation of the prairie dog. Those that bonded were able to survive on the Great Plains where there were few hiding spots and you needed people looking out for, needed others to look out for you. The mountain vole has more places to hide and needs to be less social. The naked apes on the African savanna had needs similar to prairie dogs and thus became social and passed those traits on to humans. But what is the evolutionary advantage of God? Part of the need arises pr precisely because of our neocortex. Because we have the ability to give meaning to our emotions, they are no longer temporary. A sadness that becomes despair needs hope. A fear that becomes paranoia or shame needs salvation. An anger that becomes hate needs forgiveness and reconciliation. To prolong our happiness, we count our blessings. Cultures around the world have developed rituals to massage our neural pathways. Being capable of imagining their death, humans have needed a way to placate themselves. Some believed in a heaven, some in resurrection, some in reincarnation, some in the spirit world of their energy, uh, of the ancestors, and some in the conservation of their energy. They worried about the weather. They prayed for the rains to come. They prayed for the rains to stop. They scanned the heavens for anything that would give them a clue to their fate. They prayed, and often enough, their prayers were answered. And even when they weren't answered the way they had hoped, almost always they were comforted. That was all the proof they needed of God. Intuitive proof. Humans often know things before they understand things. We were able to raise crops before we understood photosynthesis. We were able to sail before we understood the nature of the wind. The human soul. An illusion or just a reality that we don't understand yet? Is God a reality that our brains know but have yet to find a way to explain? We dreamed of flying long before we knew how, and once we learned to fly, it ceased to be a miracle. People fast and see visions. 
People eat peyote and dream dreams. Are these moments of heightened perception or distorted perceptions? What will it mean if we can induce religious euphoria or pharmacologically stimulate peace on earth and goodwill to all? Will it be real? Will we care? <laughs> if love can be reduced to the firing of neurochemicals, can we say that love is real? You could say that the presence of brain receptors is proof that such a thing as love exists. The trouble with correlations is you can't prove which causes which. What we call love is associated with brain chemistry. But which is the prime mover? Which is the first cause? And what about God? Is it the phantom leg that the amputee still feels? Or the paralyzed leg that is just beyond our perception? Our neurons dance around the holy fire sometimes passing through it, but we cannot hold it apart from the fuel of our existence. Lewis, Amini, and Lannan may point to a sacred pathway when they write, Our culture fawns over the fleetingness of falling in love while discounting the importance of loving. Loving is limbically distinct from in love. Loving is mutuality. Loving is synchronous attunement and modulation. As such, adult love depends critically on knowing one another. See, they make a distinction between the instant chemical reaction of being in love. When you see that person and your mind gets flooded and the intentional interaction with another person that changes them as it changes you. In religious terms, falling in love is called a mountaintop experience, referring to when Moses was on the mountain and it was much easier to be on the mountain with God than coming back down and talking to his people. <laughs> Some people have experiences, these mountaintop experiences, where they just know. They know that there is a God. Others seldom, if ever, have these experiences. These experiences may be the perception of something real, but we must also be aware that they can be induced. There is a whole industry of workshops that will sell you a transcendent weekend. <laughs> Drumming, self-hypnosis, silence with Trappist monks, fire walking, yoga, the sweat lodge, and much more. Some people move from religion to religion searching for the ultimate transcendent moment. Others stick to one religion and keep increasing their fervent piety, trying continuously for the next level of religious ecstasy. But I feel what is most important about religion and love is when you come down from your high. How are your relationships affected? The Old Testament has God despising the festivals and requiring justice instead. The New Testament says that true religion is helping widows and orphans. Faith is knowing there is a God. And faithfulness is acting in a divine manner. 
or to put it in non-theistic terms, transcendence is knowing that all is one. But interdependence is building those harmonious relationships. Knowing for sure that love and God exist is less important than acting loving and interdependent. For every willful act creates a new neural pathway. Loving and interdependence become habits that sustain our lives. Moments of being in love and finding transcendence will occur in our lives. And when we have them, it matters little whether they are revelations or delusions. Who cares if you are truly seeing the light or being blinded by it? Enjoy grace when it appears. But know that when your heart stops racing and the bush stops burning and the brain chemistry stabilizes, loveliness and holiness are practical pathways we can choose. I hope I got some of the neurons firing. (laughs) Give me some feedback.
E-43, a fire mist and a planet.